You are not winning any friends right now. <laughs> <laughs> At least you've given me that coin. Yes, yes, you have your coin. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host Oscar Fuchs. We're almost at the end of season two, and for today's episode, we hark back to the first ever episode of the podcast, which was with Philippe Gass, the general manager of the Shanghai Disney Resort. So, if you want to hear that side of the Disney story, be sure to go right back to season one, episode one. Philippe recommended today's guest, Murray King, who is one of those people who took an early bet on China. So we spend the first ten minutes of our chat discussing those early days when he served as a diplomat in Beijing. I wanted to cover that part of his story so that we can hear how he has been able to apply some of those skills to his current role managing public affairs at the Disney Shanghai Resort. What ensues is a mini masterclass in government negotiations and public relations. Especially in the context of how Shanghai Disney made global headlines when it became the first theme park in the world to reopen since the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. And in contrast to last week's episode with the content creator Zhao Huiling, where we talk about early career choices, Murray and I also talk about something very close to my heart, which is, after spending decades in Asia, what is your end game? And Murray actually has an answer to that question. Let's jump in then to the conversation. So, I would like you to listen to this. Oh, are you ready? Okay. So I'm thinking about a colleague of mine that has been working in China for now more than 20 years.、Um, his name is Murray King. He's the head of public affairs for Shanghai Disney Resort.、Uh, he's, I think, a beautiful example of somebody who's、um, a blend of. Western and Chinese culture, understand the culture, speaks the language. So I think he would be a great man to talk to. <laughs> That was our friend Philippe. Philippe, yeah, I met Philippe briefly when he was still the president of Disneyland Paris, and I was at Shanghai Disney Resort, and we met in Hong Kong briefly. And then、um, in the autumn of 2014, he was appointed as the general manager of Shanghai Disney Resort, and、um, you know I have a home in France, so we had a natural connection there.、Um, And、uh, yeah, we hit it off famously from the very beginning, and he's still a great friend. That's great. And of course, you would have been behind the scenes of allowing him to do the podcast with us last season, anyway, right?、Uh, I, I can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> what actually is your role? He mentioned it there, but、uh, what is your actual title at Disney?、Um, I'm、uh, the vice president of public affairs and communications for Shanghai Disney Resort to help coordinate our strategies and tactics around. Building,、um, enhancing, and then also protecting the reputation of the brand of Shanghai Disney Resort, and to、um, put that in a temporal context, you know, from the very beginning when we first announced the project, it's a major joint venture,、um, through to the development, the pre-opening, the grand opening, and then the post-opening operation period, five years of operations. Well, we'll be getting into that later、okay. on. Before we jump in, what is the object that you have bought, which in some way exemplifies your life here in China? Well, I thought really long and hard on this, <laughs> and、um, it's not going to be something that's going to be exciting, but it's something that everyone can visualize. Okay. A coin. Yes. A one renminbi coin. Quite a rare object these days. It is rare.、Um, I've been in China for many years, and coins have been part of my experience because obviously we all use or used to use hard currency. It has a peony flower, which is the unofficial flower of China, on one side, and it has one yuan on the other side, and Zhonghua Renmin Gongheguo written in Chinese. So much of China's development has been focused on its economic planning. The purchasing power of Chinese obviously has increased dramatically, certainly since I've been here.、Um, The value of the RMB has changed, and as it changes, that's also changed China's development story. Sometimes up, sometimes down, but broadly up. The way people use money, what they purchase, has changed dramatically, and people have built careers and reputations and businesses all around understanding that. And then now, you know, this is <laughs> more of something that you put in a jar at home. The people are using different forms of money, obviously digital currency. You know, in COVID nineteen, it's becoming actually a very smart way to transact because you don't have to touch something, right? Touchless payment, and so it's just you know it represents a lot about China. Great, 
And in terms of your life, does it have a personal resonance in that case? Um, you know, I've been in China now 22 years. The majority of my career and my adult life has been in China. And so if I've been successful in my career, hopefully a little bit I have. And financially, I have to thank China for that and China's opening and reform. Well, we're going to jump into our conversation, but I should note immediately that I'm quite trepidatious about this one. Because you're someone who is very polite. You're Canadian, after all. <laughs> but I know that you are going to be hard for me to get answers out of. I'm, I'm an expert winkler, but I think as much winkling as I'm going to do, you are going to parry the winkle pretty carefully. <laughs> <laughs> because it's part of your job, right? So you deal with a lot of communications. You mentioned straight away about reputation management. How does that work on a day-to-day -day basis at Disneyland? Well, I think every brand has natural attributes you know, people say it takes a lifetime to build a reputation and a moment just to lose it. Right. Um, the Disney brand has decades of history. It goes back to the 1920s. So in that sense, you know, you start from a position of advantage. But it's obviously it's more complicated than that because we're not just bringing a brand. We're bringing an experience into China. And it's in a new country. And we open this resort for the first time in a you know, more complex environment. It's the first time in the age of social media. The scale was very large. And the familiarity with the brand was different than in other markets. So my job is to help navigate the complexities of the market, to um, emphasize the positive attributes of the brand, to work with other teams, um, to ensure that we build success into the, how we represent the brand in this market rather than try to fix mistakes. So a preemptive, broad, uh, culturally sensitive and relevant strategy to make the brand relevant for this market. And, you know, the consumer at the end of the day, they, you know, consumers here are very savvy. They understand a brand's attributes. They want to experience the same quality of those attributes as any other consumer in any other marketplace. And that's what we strive to do. How did you fall into this line of work? Uh, I studied uh, history and English literature and then law um, in university in Canada. And um, I practiced uh, corporate commercial and then human rights law. Uh, for several years, and then I joined the Canadian Diplomatic Service with a focus on trade promotion. So the, in Canada at that time, the ministries of foreign affairs and international trade were merged. And so I was part of the Foreign Service with a focus on promoting Canadian exports into the Chinese market and inward um, investment promotion, so investment from China into Canada. And I had an interest in China, and at that time it seemed, this was kind of mid-90s, that there was not... Um, as much interest um, in foreign service officers in coming to a market like China, there was more interest in Europe and more traditional diplomatic postings. For me, it was clearly a number one choice. Well, where did that come from? Where did you get your interest in China at that point? Um, I had um, grown up in an international environment. I actually was born in England to parents of Scottish and English descent, and we were moved to Montreal because my father was in the aerospace industry and he had an assignment in Montreal. So from a young age, I grew up in a French-speaking area of North America, eventually stayed in Canada, eventually became a Canadian citizen. My father transitioned to the airline industry, and um, free tickets are the, uh, an important feature of the um, compensation package for family members. And so I had the opportunity to travel on free air passes um, around the world. And so by the time you know, I finished university, I'd seen a lot of the world. And so I, I had just this kind of multicultural upbringing, and I always thought, even though I had pursued a career in law initially, that I wanted to see the world more broadly and to work overseas. As I was thinking about what a career outside of Canada could look like, my heart actually pulled me towards Latin America. Great culture, fascinating history, complicated politics, beautiful landscapes and geography, and, and just so diverse and exotic but a difficult place to build a career. If you, if you have a sense of ambition, you, you can, and particularly in certain industries like natural resources. But um, when I went to China, I saw a lot of the same excitement and fascination that, you know, as a 20-something-year-old would be interested in and would be drawn to. But I also saw a real potential economically and from a career perspective. And so when I eventually joined the Foreign Service, that, that kind of had the right alignment of everything for me. I always say to, to friends, it's akin from a career perspective to if I had bought Apple stock when it was um, Steve Jobs in his, uh, in his garage, you know, building computers, I took a gamble on investing my time 
to learn a language and embrace a culture and change my career path because I believed in China and China's future. Yes, that's exactly what I feel like with people who came in the 90s. So what was it like when you first came and what were you doing back then? When I came originally, it was not easy to use local currency. You could not make purchases in most locations. You had to use friendship stores, even in big cities like Beijing. And it was Beijing that you were, right? You first came to Beijing. Yes. My posting in Beijing was in the trade section of the Canadian embassy. Um, then, you know, it was exciting because it was the age of big national trade missions. That was the time when that was a, a successful business model, and it wasn't as easy to get access to local companies and local regulators. So when you're dealing with relations at that level, we're talking about the head of state, what does that entail? Do you have to get really involved in a lot of the red tape, or were you just you know, getting the programs together? Well, I was involved in, I think, five prime minister visits, trade missions, all of them trade missions. And usually what happens is if you work at an embassy, you get assigned to do one part of the program. So in 2001, the program in Beijing included a state banquet. So typically, from a protocol perspective, um, on arrival, the Chinese side would host a state banquet to welcome the foreign leader. And then uh, our Team Canada model had a reciprocal banquet hosted by the Canadian prime minister for Chinese counterparts in government and in business. And then to leverage that banquet to invite the Canadian businesses that were part of the mission to come and participate in essentially what would be a major networking opportunity. So in 2001, I was assigned the responsibility to organize a dinner, but a dinner for approximately 2,700 people at the uh, Great Hall of the People, which involved about six months of preparation. I think it's still the largest foreign government hosted event ever held at the Great Hall of the People. Oh, wow. Because after that, they started to, the trade mission concept changed. So the largesse of the, those kinds of missions became less popular. and. The banquet was extremely complex because obviously it was much more than a dinner. There were multiple VIP and VVIP receptions. There were um, cultural performances. There were multiple arrival points at the Great Hall, depending on which level of invitation you received. There are incredible security protocols because this is essentially China's parliament building. So it involved a lot of negotiation with um, relevant ministries on both sides. A lot of fun, stressful, and you know, at the end of the day, it's a dinner. Right. It just reminds me of like someone's wedding where you, you realize, yeah, it's just a party, but this is expanded on such a huge level. And you're in the firing line because if you get it wrong, they're going to blame your department. I was definitely in the firing line and many others. I mean, I mean, a um, great team effort to help make it work. Well, you mentioned the team just then. It makes me want to jump forward. Let's miss out a little bit of your story and we'll come back to it. Let's jump forward to today then where you're at Disney. What lessons did you learn from those days that you can apply now? Um, I think years in market, you know, sometimes making mistakes yourself and sometimes seeing others make mistakes teaches you a lot about culture and also helps hone your skills and your instincts. I'd say there's a few things that, that I definitely focus on. One is always trying to understand the perspective of the stakeholders that I'm working with, especially when there's a regulator involved. The government, you know, has certain focuses. The community has certain needs. And then the company has certain advantages. Where do you find that alignment between those different competing interests? And I don't just mean in big projects. Even if you don't necessarily agree with the agenda of the person sitting opposite you, if you don't understand what that agenda is and you can't come up with some common ground and next step, then the meeting doesn't take you anywhere. And you know sometimes you don't get the second meeting. So always try to do a little bit of homework and understand based on your own knowledge and experience, but also your team, what is the agenda of the team that you're meeting with or the stakeholder? And how can you help them be successful while also delivering on your own objectives? That's the sweet spot of success here. Um, secondly, and this perhaps is more relevant in this market, is understanding the decision-making ability of the person sitting opposite you. It's quite common, I think, more in our Western world to believe that when you sit down and you have a discussion with someone, that if you're trying to reach consensus on something, you find common ground by conceding some points and holding on other points. That works well if you're engaging with someone who has the same level of ability to make those decisions. Often people show their hand too early. You know, sometimes the person sitting opposite you, you know, wants to reach an agreement, but actually then has to report back on the discussion to someone who's more senior, who then may press the reset button, and you've already 
shown a hand. So you have to go to your second position, patients understanding the shared and the differing agendas of, of individuals is important in anything here. Well, let's go back to your story. We were talking about Beijing, but here we are in Shanghai. So when did you move from Beijing to Shanghai? Um, I officially moved in uh, July of 2001. I had uh, made the decision um, because Shanghai in 2001 was probably the hottest economy in the world. It was double-digit GDP growth year on year on year, not just double, like 12 14%. And, you know, the physical infrastructure that is so iconic today, the Lu Jiazui Pudong um, skyline was still relatively early in its build out. And I got to see a lot of that. And I kind of wanted to stay and test the private sector waters. So I was offered a, an opportunity to work for an American public affairs and trade and investment consulting firm called APCO to manage their Shanghai uh, office. And in fact, I could probably do more for companies because there were some limitations on what you could do in a trade commissioner service. I could work with companies in a broader range of sectors. Um, I could work with companies from different countries. I could also work with other government agencies. And I could work for Chinese companies. You know, if you're a smart consultant, you could find the right opportunities where there was the most potential. And that's kind of what myself and, the, and a great team at APCO did um, over the years that followed. And then this is what eventually led you to Disney, right? They were one of your clients at that time. Yeah, and I, I um, started working with Disney uh, about 10, 11 years ago and officially joined in 2011. And it was just a small team at that time. We were tasked with building up a team that could help support the development and construction and start to build up awareness of what we were going to create and open. And so... What most people nowadays will remember when it comes to communications and Disneyland is when Disneyland reopened after the coronavirus. That was something where I remember hearing about it. To what extent were you involved in that process? Um, my team was involved heavily, obviously, because of media and um, you know the public announcement. Uh, a very emotional time. Uh, I think this isn't unique to Disney. It isn't unique to China. It isn't unique to you and me that um, coronavirus has been hugely impactful on people's lives in ways that I don't think any of us realized in the 21st century could happen. And um, the journey of the pandemic is different in every country. And obviously, it's well known that in China, it, it was an earlier journey. And in some markets, a later journey. And in some markets, you know, a, a much longer journey, more painful. Um, but everyone has been uh, negatively impacted. And there was so much negative news and so much tragedy. And the world was kind of ready for some, some hint that we could turn a corner globally. And because you know, our role in the community is to create happiness and joy for people, you know, what's needed most at a time of challenge like this is what we were unable to offer. And so when we were able to finally meet the conditions and we're confident that it was the right time to reopen, even though tentatively and with um, a lot of safety and health measures in place, we fully believe that that was an opportunity to inspire and to help show people that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And that was a tremendous burden and just pressure, but a tremendous opportunity. And so we were nervous, we worked hard, but we were also excited about the opportunity to help turn the page because it was just the right time for people to get some good news. And we were able to do it in a responsible way. So we were very pleased with the result. And just hearing you talk about it, I can feel the emotion. Do you count that as one of the highlights of your time in Disneyland Shanghai? I, I cer it certainly will be a, a memory, not just from, from my time at Shanghai, though, but it will be a highlight of my time in China and, and you know, my whole life, I think. What other highlights stand out that come close? Uh, I think when I moved to Shanghai, it was also very exciting. Um, Beijing was wonderful. Um, I, I love the experience. I still love Beijing. But when I came to Shanghai, it felt like home. I've learned to take more risks in life. You know, when you come on a diplomatic posting, there's a lot that's looked after for you. And um, taking the risk of stepping out of that bubble, that position of privilege that's lent to you, the status, the, the apartment, the, um, the, the role, Taking the risk to try something outside of my comfort zone was um, kind of scary, but at the same time, it was really exhilarating and exciting, intoxicating almost. 
and uh, you know, hopefully, even though I leave China, that I'll you know take a risk somewhere else and do something else, and um, and know that um, you're always the better for the risk that you take, no matter whether you fail or you succeed. Mm. Hopefully, I'll succeed. Though. <laughs> And you mentioned leaving China. So, is there an end game? Like, where where do you see your future? I don't know. I I, I um, I'm quite happy living in China. And um, you know, the tale of China it ebbs and flows. Its success, its economy, its relations. Um, but I have wonderful friends here. Um, you know, my community, my life is here. So I don't have any end game. Uh, now, practically speaking, there probably will be a day when I retire to some warm, comfortable climate where I escape from the hustle and bustle of a big city. Um, you know, I bought a home in, in France years ago. And so I have a parallel life um, that's not Canada and not the UK and not China where I, you know, I spend time on holidays and, you know, there's a community of friends that I have that's completely disconnected from my profession, from the places I grew up or the places I work. And um, I love that escapism. And so that's an option some days. Maybe, uh, maybe the south of France wouldn't be the worst choice. Right. I do know of friends who, um, older than me, that have, you know, spent 20 plus years, 30 plus years in Asia and have retired to another country. Sometimes it's hard, you know, in China, you know, for regulatory reasons, visas and healthcare and other reasons, you you decide to leave even if it's even if it's your home for many years. And um, when you're in your 60s and you make a decision to buy in a place that you don't know, first of all, it's harder to say, "Hey, I made a mistake." When you've committed at that age, it takes longer to know whether it's a place you want to live. And so, you know, I think for me, having that parallel life that um, allows me to know what that community is and whether it's a place I'd like to live one day. Having the time over many years to do that has been a good experience. Yeah. Smart. Well, I guess if it hadn't been, then you would have been selling up and trying a different country by now. So yeah, seven years later, it looks like it's working out. Right, exactly. Damn it, I haven't done that yet, and I'm going to have to figure out what that place is. Well, thank you so much, Murray. On to part two. Okay. questions they start here so i ask these questions to every guest we will start with question one what is your favorite china related fact um the word shanghai means up from the ocean shang means up yeah and hai means ocean and i think many people use that name without ever stopping and thinking why is it called shanghai so this is one big river delta it's just silt deposit over hundreds and thousands of years and we're about maybe a meter or less above sea level. So literally this is a city which hasn't just risen vertically in the last 20 years as we see the beautiful skyline of Lujazwe. It's a physical creation that has risen up from the ocean. It's still being created. If you've ever seen as maybe when you land at Pudong Airport and looked out at that coastline, there's mudflats that just stretch out into infinity and the water is a very brown color, it's silt coming down the Yangtze River and being deposited in the East China Sea. So Shanghai is continuing to be created. Wow. Do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? If I were to choose a couple of words that should be part of the English language, Mm. li hai, because it's a word that's both positive and negative. You know, somebody who is uh, is han li hai can be really strong, uh, and it can be pejorative, it can be quite negative. You know, his attitude, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's too strict, he's too strong, he's not flexible enough, um, worse personality. Um, but, you know, you can also describe someone who's Lehi, is really good at something, who's really got great competency or skill. It can be very different meanings depending on the context. Yeah, the contextuality of it is so rich. Which Lehi are you, do you think? <laughs> oh, uh, if you ask one of the people that works with me, they might have a negative <laughs> I like to think that I'm both um, and neither, that I'm just, you know, just me. Yeah. The second thing. Tao Yan. Tao Yan, the literal context means disgusting. Oh, dislike, right. Yes. But if a girl were to say to you, Ani Han Tao Yan, they're saying it in a, in, a, in a positive way. Really? Almost in a flirtatious way. Right. Um, no one flirts with me, Murray. It's a sad story. No, I'm sure that someone <laughs> does. I'm sure that someone does. That's great. Thank you for that. Mm. What is your favorite destination within China? Pingyao, Pingyao Guchang. I think maybe others have said that too. It's no. incredible. I would recommend it to anybody. 
you know, it's a walled city, it's about six square kilometers, rises up out of the agricultural plains of Shanxi province. And it is a tremendous experience. It feels like you're stepping into a, a Ming Dynasty movie. And within that walled city, um, it's a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site. So there's really no development on the outside of the, of the walled city. So it's mostly just farmland. Of course, there's a few tourist things that have popped up. But within the, the walled city, there really are no cars. You can rent a bicycle. You can bike around the city on the wall. Um, there's lots of traditional hotels and restaurants and great food and great people um, and just a wonderful experience. The photos I saw for my friend's holiday there did show a mass of tourists, though. So yeah. that's the one downside, right? Well, I was lucky enough to go 20 years ago. Um, <sighs> if you left China, what would you miss the most and what would you miss the least? The most is the excitement of every day. Um, every day something is happening. I learn something. I'm challenged in some way. I also feel like I can contribute in some way. I just feel like it's where everything's happening. So that's what I would miss the most. What I would miss the least is the fast pace. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense, but when I do get out of the country and, and when I go to my comfort zone, to France or, or somewhere else, you know, it's really nice to not have a fast pace. And, um, you know, every so often you need to kind of recharge your batteries. I think that's obvious. And um, the problem is when I'm there, I miss the fast pace after a couple of weeks. When I'm here after a few months, I need a break from the fast pace. So I'm never going to be completely happy in either. Thank you for saying that so well. Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? Yes. Uh, I can't tell you what they are because it will be tomorrow's surprise. But there's definitely things that surprise me. But sometimes surprise me in special ways. I, I give you, you know, kind of a unique example. I remember when I first came here, you know, I had the, um, the opportunity to travel domestically. And this was like 27 years ago. And in those days, you got a boarding pass, you went to a small airport terminal, and then you would be bussed out or you'd walk out to the aircraft on the tarmac and it wasn't anything like it is now. And um, even though you had a reserved seat, you know, there was a scrum to get onto the flight. And it was, I mean, it was a rough scrum. And um, you knew you had your seat in theory. Um, sometimes you had to sort of remind people who got your seat that it was your seat. And you know, it, always, it would always work out. And then, you know, the same thing on an escalator everybody would just push in and there's a lot of reasons for that and, and it's not a criticism but I, I remember it was like about eight years ago um, I was on an escalator going up uh, to the second floor in my office building at the time and um, I looked up and I noticed that everyone was standing to the right everybody without exception and it just made me realize everything you thought you knew was different because people are progressing and society is changing so quickly and so dynamically and it's just the smallest of things, but um, it's exciting to see it, and it's exciting to be part of it. And I kind of almost felt like I was the one that was kind of standing on the wrong side. So your perspective changes. Yes. And when you see it as a stark image, like you said, then it, it does hit home. Yeah. Very good. What is your favorite place to go out, to eat or drink or just hang out? I'm on the Bund. Oh, there you go. And I hope it exists forever, um, at least as long as I'm here. I almost feel like it's named after me because the M for Murray is, um, it's not for me. Um, it's for Michelle who owns the restaurant. But um, I love the restaurant. I love the location. I love the, the cuisine. I love the branding. I love the feel of the place. I also love Wukonglu. Uh, it's just a beautiful area. And Anfulu, Hunanlu, Xingguolu, that whole area. So I spend a lot of time at the little cafes and restaurants there when I have a chance to come back to the Pusi side of Shanghai. Yes, I think that's where we first met, in one of those cafes there, right? That's right. What is the best or worst purchase you have made in China? I bought a 1920s house on Wukonglu years ago. Damn you! You're one of those people who got in there early enough. I made the brave decision to buy, you know, the top of a 1920s house, a standalone house, so the top part of that house, in about 2005, and um, lived in it for seven years and had a wonderful experience. And then I sold it. And, you know, the old adage, buy low, sell high, <laughs> definitely applies to real estate in Shanghai. You are not winning any friends right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you've given me that coin. <laughs> yes, yes, you have your coin, yes. <laughs> Now the hardest question, what is your favorite WeChat sticker? And it's a great question, actually, because I communicate more <laughs> by stickers than by text. Um, so there's a series of WeChat stickers, which is called Xiaoliu, 
little Leo. And uh, yeah. it's actually a, you know, a couple of characters. There's a duck and there's a cat. And I think there's a couple of other characters that occasionally make an appearance. <laughs> And um, I just think that the designs are brilliant, and uh, it's just super fun and a little bit naughty. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's me. Now, here's a funny thing. When I had a diplomat in season one, he worked for the New Zealand consulate here. He was always careful about stickers because they can be misconstrued. And when you give me this cheeky naughtiness, that's kind of what he was slightly worried about. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't use WeChat stickers. Do you think if you were still a diplomat, you would have these stickers? I think these are cheeky naughty, but they I think they're not even close to crossing the line of being <laughs> inappropriate. Um, although there are some others that are probably less appropriate. Um, I think if I was still a diplomat, I would be more careful about using WeChat. Um, At all. And I would mm. um, certainly be careful about what I used, but yeah, I think these are harmless enough. I think the world has changed a lot as well. Yeah. You know, people are communicating more primitively <laughs> and yet in a more sophisticated way through things like videos and photos yeah. and abbreviations and uh, emoticons and GIFs and things like that. Yes. Let's go into the societal history about hieroglyphics, because that's what we're doing, really, using GIFs and using emojis, right? Right, right. Very good. These are super cute. You'll, um, you'll be converted quickly, because there's a great range of stickers. that I'll, um, <laughs> All of my stickers are Xiaolio now. Beautiful. What is your go-to song to sing at KTV? Yikes. I haven't been to KTV in a while. But, you know, um, many I, people I, say that now. Yeah, well, you know, times have changed. Times have times changed. Times have changed. Yeah. Um, there's a few, but I guess the one that I like to sing, if I can sing with somebody else, because it's um, probably more known as a female song, Ho Lai, Liu Ying. Okay. It's a song, you know, by a Taiwanese singer that probably is 15, 20 years old now. And, um, you know, when I learned Chinese and I tried to improve my colloquial Chinese, I did it by trying to listen to more Chinese pop music. It's a great way to entertain yourself and learn a language. And it's just one of the early songs that, you know, it's, it's kind of just a tune that stuck with me and, you know, kind of gnawed at me and stayed with me. And so you have to learn one song, right? You need your karaoke song. So that was my song because nobody would have expected I could sing that song, ah. right? It's not like Dui Mian De Niu Hai Kan Guo Lai, which is very common. I have learned Dui Mian De Niu Hai Kan Guo Lai <laughs> because it's the easiest for me. It's a fun song, too. Yeah. yeah. And finally, what China-related media or sources of information do you rely on? I try to look at everything I can. So South China Morning Post is a great way to get some of the mainland news in a less filtered way. Uh, strangely enough, I like Shanghai Daily. Their metro news is great. Mm. It's a great way to get a fix on local news. Um, Sinocism yeah. uh, is great. Um, Shanghai Fabu, the Shanghai Information Office. Everybody should have Shanghai Fabu on their WeChat um, as a subscription. And you know, the best news I get is just what I see and hear. Yeah. Exactly. Well, very good. Thank you so much, Murray. Yes, yeah, my pleasure. The only thing left for me to ask you is, out of everyone you know in China, and this could include your 20 years experience, who do you think I should interview for the next season of Mosaic of China? It's a good question, Oscar. I, there's lots of choices, actually, but I thought I would try and orient you in a different direction and try someone uh, maybe from a different industry. And so I would like to recommend Diana Xu, Su Dan. She is a lady from Northeast China, from Jilin province, who in 2012 was crowned Miss Universe China. Oh, wow. So she's a beauty queen, um, but she's a very smart lady as well. She uh, went to Las Vegas and represented China in the Miss Universe pageant and won Best National Costume, oh. a Guo Pei design. And, um, you know, she, she had an incredible experience as a young woman in a unique place at a unique time and then uh, obviously came back to China, uh, fulfilled her duties for one year and then has gone on to build her own career and, and business. That's great. Well, once again, thanks for your time, Murray. Pleasure. So I mentioned that there had been another diplomat on Mosaic of China, but I forgot to name him. Well, let me correct that. It was Tom Barker from season one, episode 25. And it struck me that, unbelievably, Tom and I talked about a fictional diplomat by the name of Murray in his episode. I wish I had figured that out a little earlier than right now, although perhaps the real Murray from today's episode wouldn't have been too amused by the comparison. <laughs> 
Regular listeners' ears might have pricked up when Murray mentioned that his favourite KTV song was not Dwemienda Newhar Kangwa Lai, because it was the favourite for two previous guests, Stefan de Mongo, the events company CEO from Season 1, Episode 19, and Vladimir Jurovic, the brand naming expert from Season 2, Episode 13. And the final fun connection came when Murray was explaining how the phrase Nihan Tao Yen can be used flirtatiously. This reminded me of the kind of Shanghainese female that Nick Yu, the playwright from Season 1, Episode 13, was describing with his favourite word in Chinese, Zuo. As always, type Mosaic of China into Instagram, Facebook or WeChat to see all the accompanying images for today's show, spanning Murray's whole time in China as well as his parallel life in France. And head to the website to follow the transcript from the conversation or to subscribe to the premium version of the show. I covered a lot more with Murray than I could fit into this regular version and here are some clips to prove it. I was here when SARS reared its ugly head, and that was 2003 in the spring. Which do you prefer, Beijing or Shanghai? Do you prefer your father or your mother? Uh, <laughs> okay. There was a message on my phone with a draft press release to close the resort. Two days later, I was on a plane back. Yeah. Disney has been in China since the 1920s. Snow White premiered in Shanghai and in Nanjing. Even if you're not a person that generally gets emotional, sometimes a little show helps. We talk every day, obviously, he's my brother, he's my twin, actually, so... What? Yeah. Do they actually know there's two of you, right? They, they do, <laughs> they, they do. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs, with artwork by Denny Newell. I'm still in touch with the person who referred Murray to the show, Philippe Gass, from season one. But Philippe is extremely busy these days working on an 8 billion US dollar entertainment project in Saudi Arabia, so I couldn't find my way into his calendar to record a follow up. Instead, I'm including a catch up from one of the other most popular guests from last season, which was Emily Madge, the sea life conservation expert from episode 14 of season 1. So please enjoy listening to her voice once again, and I'll see you next week with the last new guest of season 2. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm well, but you, you look amazing. Do I? Thank you. <laughs> well, let me jump straight in. So, Emily, yours was one of the most popular episodes of season one. At that time, you were based in the Shanghai Sea Life Center, right? Correct. Yes. So tell me about where I find you today. <laughs> so since then, I've moved over the waters to Bangkok. So I'm currently based in Sea Life Bangkok Aquarium, doing the same job, just in a different region and loving it, loving my life in Thailand. Uh, I can tell by the way <laughs> you are smiling. Your face looks tanned, your hair looks blonde. <laughs> You know, I've been hitting those beaches, checking it out. It's great. Your move was planned, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was actually delayed a little bit in China. And then fortunately, I got to Thailand just before the borders closed and everything. So I actually left China for vacation in January to go to New Zealand. And I came here a bit sooner than expected. And my company helped me move my stuff from there. So I've never actually been back to Shanghai since I left. <laughs> Right, I was wondering whether I'd missed your goodbye party. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would have got an invite. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the big thing about our episode was the huge job that you and your team undertook in terms of relocating a couple of beluga whales from Shanghai to Iceland. Yes. So the obvious question is, what is the update with the whales? So the whales are doing really well. They went straight into a kind of holding facility that was indoors just to get them acclimated to everything. And then they've been released out into the bay and just practicing recall. We fed them up so they had a nice layer of fat ready to go over for the colder waters. But there's also other factors. So for example, the whales, they breach the surface to breathe. 
in Iceland when it's stormy and they're not used to having to breach uh-huh. and, and stuff. So they're having to acclimatize to their new environment. We've had some wonderful videos where they've been to the bottom and been picking up starfish and bringing it to the keepers out of curiosity and a lovely, lovely video of um, both of them just breaching the surface and just sat there and feeling the rain on their skin. Obviously, the first time they felt rain and very heartwarming to watch. Amazing. Yeah. And their future will always be within that semi-wild sanctuary or will they ever be released beyond that? No, it'll always be in that sanctuary. They've just been in captivity for too long. It's too much of a risk. They don't have those kind of natural instincts to survive in the wild. It must just be just a different world for them to just have constant change in environment all the time. Yes. I think about those beluga whales going to their natural environment. And then I look at you and you're this kind of Welsh (laughs) mermaid. And you were stuck on land here in Shanghai. And it it now looks like you've been transplanted into your natural environment. That's how it feels for me. That's how it feels in close proximity to the ocean and to beaches. I did struggle. I did. I'm, I'm not a city girl. And I did feel that kind of city vibe in Shanghai. As wonderful as it was and as wonderful as the people were that I met, I am happier closer to the sea. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Emily. I'm really happy that we had someone who represented something so unusual in the first season. When I met you at that party, I knew that I had to get you onto the <laughs> podcast. And now that's it. You're stuck in the mosaic forever and ever. <laughs> I'm happy to be a part of it. And it's lovely to catch up with you. Thank you so much for having me on here. <laughs>